Okay. Good morning, everybody. Johnny Drive by here. I've decided to try and do this live streaming thing again. It's been a long time. It's <laughs> been a long time. But I'm going to go over, oh, what is the name of this? Naomi Sabiet Saib and her journey to climate realism. I believe she's some right wing kind of girl that was done or uh, I can't remember what her name was, but promoted her a little bit because she's a right winger kind of a, maybe even, maybe even a white supremacist kind of a gal. But anyway, let's look at what she's got to say. Uh, Thanks for having me. <laughs> so um, I used to be a climate change alarmist myself because Obviously, as a young girl, I grew up around the climate change hysteria. Um, I grew up with it in the media, in my school books and on TV. And um, I was the first one to, uh, whenever my beliefs were, were questioned, I was the first one to ask uh, the question, uh, so are you saying that you are a climate change denier? And of course, especially as a German girl, um, the word denier carries a lot of weight. And today I consider it an atrocious insult. But back then I didn't think about that. And um, I was an innocent young girl. And I thought that by hugging the trees, uh, I could save the planet, which quite frankly uh, turned out not to be true. And I took pride in uh, buying paper bags instead of plastic bags. But um, I didn't really make a change. Then eventually, um, in 2015, roughly, I became a skeptic. And at first, not with regards to climate science, but rather um, with regards to the migration crisis in Germany. And once you start um, exploring these political topics that are more uh, on the right, I guess, or in the libertarian department, um, things spiral out of control and you go down the path of uh, understanding that uh, many topics such as feminism, gender, uh, socialism, postmodernism, and climate change uh, hysteria, they are all related in some way. and um, paved the way for uh, a very bad kind of totalitarianism. And I, I'd always... loved science as well so uh, naturally I had to become a climate change denier a skeptic science you see is entirely based on intellectual humility and it is important that we keep questioning the narrative that is out there instead of promoting it
And these days, uh, climate change um, science really isn't a science at all. Those self-proclaimed scientists, um, we've heard it today, they draw their conclusions before. Or even testing their hypothesis, and they base their assumptions on completely incoherent models, which is just an insult. to science itself. And I ask myself, what is the goal of all of this? And I believe, unfortunately, that the goal is to shame humanity. Climate change alarmism at its very core is a very a despicably anti-human ideology. And we are told to look down upon our achievements with guilt. with shame and with disgust and not even to take into account the many major benefits that we have gained from using fossil fuels as our main energy source because look around we're living in such an amazing era of um, fast progress of innovation and we are not allowed to be proud of that at all Instead, um, debates are being shut down and uh, scientists, real scientists, lose their jobs for performing the most genuine and innocent form of science there is, which is just real science, real skepticism. Okay, Pinball, can you hear me? Got this new setup here. Uh, I don't even know if I'm doing this right. If my mic's working or anything. Uh, can I see the chat? Ah, there we go. I found it. 
Hey, can you see me, Pinball? Can you hear me? Coffee. Can you hear me, people? I've never done this through this, what is it, stream yard or whatever? <laughs> hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah, she does. Uh, can you Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, I think, I think this. I think this was uh, the right answer to Greta, <laughs> or that they're trying to answer to it. I gotta go back here because I think I have my mic muted. Grew up around the climate change hysteria. Um, I grew up with it in the media, in my school books, and on TV, and um, I was the first one to. Uh, whenever my beliefs were, were questioned, I was the first one to ask uh, the question. Is it working uh, better so now? Are you saying that you are a climate change denier? And of course, especially as a German girl, um, the word denier carries a lot of weight. And today I consider it an atrocious insult. But back then I didn't think about that. And um, I was an innocent young girl and I thought that by hugging the trees, uh, I could save the planet, which quite frankly uh, turned out not to be true. And I took pride in uh, buying paper bags instead of plastic bags, but um, I didn't really make a change. So you didn't really make a change. So you're talking about feudalism then? Is that what you're trying to get at? Um, you see, when it comes to climate science, and I just said this before, but the mic was off, but you know what, I, I gotta say it again. When it comes to climate science, we look at the science. We don't look at politicians. We don't look at pundits. We don't look at blogs. We don't look at anything like that. I mean, my opinion means jack when it comes to climate change and climate science. Uh, it, uh, the Heartland Institute you, you has a bad reputation of. I mean, they're in the they're in the pocket of big oil for one thing. They're, you're financed by big oil and other other corporations, I should say. But you're basically a think tank that tries and figures out how to find little cherry picking little dots inside of the information and the data to figure out how to make it look like it's not the right thing. Um, yeah. So anyway, if you go over the actual science and look at the data, you'll see that our climate models are working. They've, they're pretty predictable. Uh, <laughs> they've predicted pretty well. And I, I don't know. Heartland just... <laughs> you're you're the AIG of of uh, climate science, I guess. Then eventually, um, in 2015, roughly, I became skeptic, and at first, not with regards to climate science, but rather um, with regards to the migration crisis in Germany. And once you start um, exploring these political topics that are more, once you start exploring these political topics you know it's almost like you're projecting like i just said we don't want the politics in there so why why even look at the politics when it comes to climate change i mean that, that's what the heartland institute would want you to do i guess uh on the right i guess or in the libertarian department um things spiral out of control and you go down the path of uh, understanding that uh, many topics such as feminism, gender, uh, socialism, postmodernism, and climate change uh, hysteria. Oh, so you're conflating all of these groups together in with climate science. I don't understand why you do that. What does that? What does feminism ha feminism have to do with climate science? Projecting. I think they are all related in some way and um, paved the way for uh, a very bad kind of totalitarianism. They're related in one way, in some way, 
and it's probably that you just disagree with them, isn't it? And I, I'd always have sides as well. So uh, naturally, I have your ignorance of it is showing, though. To become a climate change denier, a skeptic. Science, you see, is entirely based on intellectual humility, and it is important that we keep questioning the narrative. Okay. Questioning the narrative is something that I got to wonder what you're saying there. That sounds like you're using semantics now. The narrative is not what science does. We don't go after a narrative. It's, <laughs> you know what? Eesh. What a bunch of crap. Jeez. Yeah, somebody in the chat just said, you're no Greta. That's for sure. Are you the answer, the right wing's answer to Greta? The Heartland Institute? <laughs> that is out there instead of promoting it. And these days, uh, climate change um, science really isn't a science at all. I guess if you look at the blogs that you're, you've been reading, <laughs> climate science is probably one of the more difficult sciences there is. I mean, it spans a lot of disciplines for one thing. I'd say, <laughs> I'd say you just, you just made a huge claim right there. It isn't a science at all. Wow. 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 Has, has a propaganda gotten that far? Those self-proclaimed scientists, um, we've heard it today. They draw their conclusions before you. Self-proclaimed scientists. Self-proclaimed scientists, you definitely need to have something in your freaking information down there in your description that tells me what, <laughs> tell me these self-proclaimed scientists. That is one heck of a claim. That's a bold ass lie. <laughs> I'm testing their hypothesis and they base their assumptions on completely incoherent models. No, they don't. Their models actually do predict. They're working very fine. They're, I mean, they get better as we go on. But they're pretty close. Which is just an insult to science itself. No, you're an insult to science. And I ask myself, what is the goal of all of this? And I believe, unfortunately, that the goal is to shame humanity. <sighs> to shame humanity. That is the goal of climate science. Well, you know what? It probably humanity should be shamed because we probably deserve it. But you know what? That is not the goal. <laughs> wow. Are you just a propaganda mouthpiece? Climate change alarmism at its very core is a very a despicably anti human ideology. Oh, that's a mouthful. A despicably anti human ideology. Ideology. Are you sure you're not projecting? And we are told to look down upon our achievements with guilt, with shame, and with disgust, and not even to take into account the many major benefits that we have gained from using fossil fuels as our main energy source. It's another bald ass lie. No, we we we're pretty proud of what we've done. But you know what? If it's going to be harmful to us and we realize it, we discover that it's harmful to us, we should do something about it. Even if you even if you didn't think that climate change, if, if you don't in your position, if you don't think climate change is a thing, it would be better and more profitable. It's better for the economy if we do these things and change the way we live. It's just healthier for us, for one thing, as a species. Ridiculous. Because look around, we're living in such an amazing era of um, fast progress, of innovation, and we are not allowed to be proud of that. Nobody ever said that you're not allowed to be proud of it. At all. Instead, um, debates are being shut down and scientists, real scientists, lose their jobs. <laughs> okay, so now, now you got... Self-proclaimed scientists and real scientists. Is that what you're trying to say? That you that these bloggers and stuff on YouTube are the real scientists? You are a mouthful of freaking lies, girl. For performing the most genuine and innocent form of science there is, which is just 
real science, real skepticism. That is quite the claim from somebody that just likes science. And that is not just an insult to science, that is an insult. You are an insult to science. To the complexity of nature, and, and most, most importantly, it is an insult to the freedom of speech. How in the frickin' hell is that an insult to freedom of speech? They can all, nobody shut down their blogs. They should, <laughs> but you know, no, they shouldn't because I like to see how stupid some people are, but you know what? It's just, if it's, if it's going to destroy our species, what good is it? I mean, there's nothing really I can do. I'm, I'm one person, right? Is that what you felt like? I mean, come on, girl. You're, you're nothing but a propaganda piece. You're a useful idiot. And that's why we are here today, to speak up and to bring the spirit of science back to life again. And I hope... Bring the spirit of science back to life again by using your pseudo-scientific methods, huh? I hope that you will do the same with us together. Thank you so much for having me. Wow. Seriously. I've never seen such crap in my life. Wow. Wow. I'm blown away. You know what? I don't even... I don't even blame her at all. She she, she just popped up and I think she just take... Well, that, you know what? I blame her for coming up there and doing that. But wow. That is just a bunch of crap. Just... <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, you're right. Whoever taught her is proud that <laughs> the shame and not her. <laughs> uh, and yeah, the Heartland Institute is a is an old, nasty religious cult hiding in Kansas. Yeah, yeah. The, talk about projection. I, I, I've never. I just. Did she even say anything that was credible? Like, did she debunk any science? No, she didn't. I don't see her get. She won't get the Nobel Prize anytime soon. I mean, that, that was that was the biggest load of crap. I'm, wow. <laughs> I think next time I'm gonna have to review the video before I get all riled up about it like this. <laughs> all right, let's find something else here. That's just crazy. Let's see, what else can we do? Maybe we'll go and check out. As long as we're on climate science, we might as well freaking go to Patrick Moore. Ah, here we go. Rebutting alarmism. Are we going to hear some good scientific debunking by these guys now? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm the president of the Independent Institute. I want to welcome you to the second of our two live stream panel forums to respond to the Global Climate Action Forum in San Francisco. We're delighted to be partnering with the Heartland Institute, and this forum is being held here at the Independent Institute's Conference Center in Oakland, California. Leading this second panel is again James Taylor, Senior Fellow for Environment and Energy Policy at the Heartland Institute. James studied atmospheric science at Dartmouth College and received his JD from Syracuse University. He's a regular columnist at Forbes and he's appeared at CNN, Fox News Channel, MSNBC. Yeah, exactly, unstructured. It'd create doubts and that's the spiel. Stick a guy in there and you got it. <laughs> Unfalsifiable BS. You see PBS, CB CBS, ABC, and elsewhere, <clears throat> excuse me, and as many articles have appeared in newspapers across the United States. Thank you for joining with us, James. 
Thank you so much, David. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, and I feel even more strongly today, uh, it, it truly has been a pleasure being here at the Independent Institute in Oakland, California. Uh, the hospitality of you and your staff have been amazing. And, uh, and, and the more that I'm here, the more I learn about the Independent Institute. I see on the table uh, several uh, books on energy and environment topics that you've published. And that's just one of the many endeavors that the Independent Institute pursues. Uh, you truly are a, an amazing contribution to the cause of human freedom and liberty and, and human welfare as a whole. So thank you for having us here. It's truly a pleasure. I hope we can work together uh, closely in the future. So here we got the Independent Institute. <laughs> and... Satan is board director. They sell to me. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is the Independent Institute now. And what are they? Okay. Scientific panel on the global climate. Now here, we, we got to see who this is. Uh, we got James M. Taylor, J.H. Lair. So let's Google J.H. Lair. J.H. Lair is a senior fellow and science director of the Heartland Institute. Okay, so we got the Heartland coming in here again. He is also a motivational speaker and a prolific writer. He was editor of Rational Readings of Environmental Concerns, which labels environmentalists as extremists and alarmists, among other things. So he's, yeah, there you go. Then we got James Taylor. Let's see who he is. I think I know who he is. James M. Taylor. James Taylor is director of the Arthur B. Robinson Center for Climate, and Taylor is the former managing editor of the Environment Clowns of uh, his Heartland Institute guy, too. So there we have it. The root of all of our bull crap here from the Heartland Institute. Once again, we are here to provide a rebuttal for the Global Climate Action Summit. Uh, this has been planned for the past year by Governor Jerry Brown in California here in the San Francisco Bay Area. This is supposed to be their uh, showpiece to, I guess, uh, serve in contradiction to President Donald Trump, his decision to pull out the Paris Agreement and uh, Trump's uh, climate policies in general. So it's interesting to compare and contrast what is and isn't happening, what is and isn't being presented scientifically at the Global Climate Action Summit. And then I invite you to compare it to what we are presenting here today and make up your own minds. So once again, we have a panel of scientists and uh, climate policy experts that will be participating in the panel. From camera left to right, we have Tom Harris. He is the president of the International Climate Science Coalition. He's an engineer. He's well-versed on, on a, a wide, wide variety, variety of climate of science, science topics. topics. Uh, uh, next, next to him, we have Dr. Richard Keene. Dr. Keene is the Minnesota Instructor, Instructor in Meteorology and Climate, and climate science, science at the University of Colorado. Of Colorado. Next, next to him, we have uh, Dr. Dr. Stanley uh, Goldenberg, Goldenberg, who is a meteorologist in Miami. Besides being a meteorologist, uh, he is one of the scientists who goes on board airplanes uh, that fly into hurricanes to measure wind speed and other hurricane characteristics. Uh, so uh, Stan uh, has many interesting stories to tell. I don't know if we'll get to them because we want to talk about the science today. But look him up on uh, on an internet search and look up some of the videos he's done, not just about his flying into uh, hurricanes, but his personal experience uh, undergoing Hurricane Andrew, I believe it was, which struck uh, his home in Homestead, is it? Uh, no, just near Miami, in Miami. Area, in Miami. Right. All right. And next to him, we have Dr. Terry Gannon. He is a research fellow here at the Independent Institute. He has a scientific background in device physics. He also studies climate science. Uh, on my right is Dr. J. Why is it that it's usually physicians, or not physicians, but uh, physics, people that are good at physics and math like that, that think that they got something, they're, they're usually the ones that are the, the deniers or whatever, the, the climate 
climate deniers, I guess is what the word, <laughs> uh, we're alarmists and they're deniers, but hey, it's it's nothing new, it's, it's science, man. But uh, yeah, I just, the propaganda Jay Lair, is so he freaking is the science just, director just like at the Heartland Institute. He received the first PhD in the nation in groundwater hydrology. So in addition to being well versed oh, so on fracker. climate change and related matters, he's a fracker. <laughs> oftentimes, the discussion uh, goes into drought and precipitation and uh, water availability. Jay Lair is quite the expert on that topic. And I'm James Taylor. I am senior fellow at the Heartland Institute. So before we get into a discussion on particular scientific topics, after all, this is the point of this panel yesterday and today is to provide the science uh, that supports the skeptic, and I like to call it the realist cause, regarding global warming. Uh, but before we get into that, I think it's worth noting what has and hasn't occurred at the Global Climate Action Summit down the road uh, at the Moscone Center uh, in San Francisco. What we see is no science whatsoever. This is their opportunity. This has been billed as their signature event to oppose President Donald Trump's decision to pull out of the Paris Agreement. This is their signature event to present the case for their climate alarmism. And yet, if you watch, if you have been watching their summit, if not, if you're able to go back to an archive, watch it. I encourage you to. I would encourage you if they presented science, but I especially encourage you to watch it because they present no science whatsoever. And this is a case across the board. Time and time again, when you ask the people who claim that there is no scientific dispute, that there is no reasonable conversation that can be had, and you ask them to discuss the science, they say, I don't want to discuss the science. I won't discuss the science. There's a reason. Because the scientific evidence is strongly in support of skeptics and realists who recognize that climate change occurs, who recognize that human Yeah, find something newer on this. This is like last year's. This is August. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I have the privilege of being the president of the Independent Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you to our program this evening. As many of you may know, um, the Independent Institute holds uh, uh, programs like, like this, this debates, um, lectures, and other presentations, which we call the Independent Policy Forum. And tonight, we're greatly pleased uh, to welcome two distinguished scientists, Dr. Willie Soon and Dr. Elliot Bloom, who will be speaking tonight on global warming, fact or fiction. And I want to especially thank Dr. Terry and Mrs. <laughs> Carolyn Gannon for their wonderful assistance in making tonight possible. So th yeah, I agree. Yeah, they're, they're all freaking liars, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, they have to know that they're not telling the truth because uh, my my knowledge on it is probably sixth seventh grade elementary school science and it's i still can understand that <laughs> that, that they're spewing a bunch of crap I, I don't know how people can be that ignorant of it but i guess they are thank you very much Applaud your own ignorance. Very For those well. of you who are new to the Independence, you'll also, also find information in your packet about us. Uh, I'll also point out that in keeping with tonight's topic, we included five summaries of papers by Dr. Soon in your packet, as well as a copy of the testimony by Dr. John Christie, um, who is from the University of Alabama. Uh, and I'll make a mention about that in a minute. Dr. Christie gave the testimony before the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Uh, he's a distinguished professor in his own right of atmospheric science and director of the Earth System Science Center at the University of Alabama at Huntsville. So I hope you'll enjoy that. You know, I left, uh, I left getting into comment sections in the climate debate 
over over three years ago and just started kind of focusing on religion. And the reason why is because of these freaking lying pieces of shit. They've they perpetuated this freaking narrative that that uh, there's this conspiracy out there. They they use people's biases against them to to push their own freaking agenda and to keep their money coming into their profits. It's it's just sickening to me. And I don't know, maybe it's too late. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> Feel sorry for the next generation for sure. And that material, I think you'll see, be quite relevant to our discussion this evening. Uh, Independent Institute is a public policy research institute. We have about 140 fellows. Uh, we produce lots of books. <laughs> uh, we also produce the Independent Review, and there are some sample copies out on the book That table. we got to put up. <laughs> um, we uh, were thrilled also to feature a book this evening um, called Hot Talk Called Science by one of our research fellows. His name is Fred Singer. Anyway, the mission of Independent is to build the advanced peaceful, <laughs> like prosperous, that. and free societies grounded in a commitment to human worth and dignity. And the results of that work uh, does result in the books and publications I mentioned, as well as organizing uh, various conference and media programs like tonight that we're delighted to be hosting. Um, the issue for tonight is one of great... Is there any uh, video that you'd dispute, like to look at, by the way? Uh, a lot of emotion. I'm just going off a random here for trying to find some. Um, Getting back in the swing of doing uh, live streams. Major presentation this evening is going to be by Dr. Willie Soon. Um, uh, Willie Soon is another that, chill. Uh, the issue of global warming... <laughs> Um, sort of boils down to a number of questions. Uh, is global warming real? Are man-made CO2 emissions a dangerous, imminent, and irreversible threat yeah, the question to life on Earth? Have such predictions been scientifically established? Fifth grade science, um, yes, they have. Have the forecasts from the many CO2-based climate models been right? And if not, why not? Yes, they have. What about solar influences on climate, including on the clouds, on the oceans, on wind. And what would man I love the way he uses his, uses his language to, uh, if they were, for the, are they wrong? And if so, how? <laughs> he doesn't say that they could be right. He doesn't use that. He avoids that kind of language. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I believe that. <laughs> Oops, I don't want to do that again. There we go. I mean, <laughs> wow, the semantics and, oh, man, I can't believe. Massive carbon taxes or perhaps the Green New Deal and other controls uh, produce that for people are that the people ignorant. of America or and that the world, especially the poor. Obtuse. I think being obtuse is better um, for them. Dr. Dr. Soon himself received his Ph.D. with distinction in aeronautical engineering from the University of Southern California. He's been an astronomer at the Mount Wilson Observatory, a senior scientist at the George C. Marshall Institute, senior visiting fellow at the State Key Laboratory of Marine Environmental Science at Zeeman University, and professor of, University of Environmental Studies at the University of Putra in Malaysia. He's the author of a number of books, as well as over 90 scientific papers. He's a recipient of the IEEE Nuclear and Plasma Science Society Award, the Rockwell Science Hunt Award, the Smithsonian Institution Award, the Courage and Defense of Science Award, and many others. Um, the renowned. I tend to have this tendency type okay, of Willie. language. <clears throat> well, I really thank you all. You know, it's full house, right? I mean, my typical size of audience is five, so I really, really humbly appreciate everybody for coming. My job is rather easy tonight because I want to talk about this gas, this satanic gas, we will call it, you know. This satanic gas called CO2, carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide, according to the wisdom of uh, what you call the United Nations uh, uh, Intergovernmental so, Panel on Climate the Change Reports, that what says that Parker if Solar you were to keep putting this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the globe, the globe is going to warm, the sea is going to rise, the polar bear is going to say, stop drinking Coca-Cola and say goodbye. And many, many other problems, by the way. Your kids will get ADHD, all kinds of problems. There will be more marijuana and all that stuff, you know, so on and so forth. 
I'm here trying to tell you that this CO2 is not that powerful in that sense. The only thing it does to the system is actually make the planet greener. So I apologize if this really bothers anyone. It only makes the planet greener. And, you know, it might, might, might be greener and it might be whatever for plants, but that's not any good for us, dude. I mean, yeah, we had a different world when the planet was hotter. I, I think it was, I think it was like uh, filled with giant freaking lizards or lizard like creatures <laughs> or bird like creatures. I chomp you in half. Yeah, let's let's go back to that. Measuring its weather. And I also wanted to say that, you know, in the in the spirit of science, I will at least try to tell you that if there's anything okay. that I say offend anybody, Circling the sun I probably apologize huh? first because I tend to have the tendency to be a bit more hyper excited. But my passion is very sincere. It's all about science. All the way down, it's all about science, nothing else. Because if I want to be wrong and say anything that's not truthful, you just hang me right here, right? No problem. Let's just talk about it. If there's anything that we disagree, let's talk about it. And most important of all, if anything that is not clear at all, you all can look for Independent Institute, Terry Gagnon, my good friend. In fact, I also want to acknowledge my three Irish uh, colleagues from Ireland. These are the most excellent scientists I ever had the privilege to work with. And uh, we're going to have a theme to try to discuss what this CO2 claimed by all these world experts that it turns out to be not so. The most important lessons about science is clear, right? I mean, I have a quote here by Professor Richard Feynman. He is among the finest physicists physicist America ever seen. And it's really to try to get to the essence that science is not about consensus. Have you all heard about the consensus business? 97%, I mean, the kind of stuff they're pulling is very, very bad, actually. All these 97, 99% consensus, it means nothing. It's all, it's all actually asking a simple like, question like, yeah, yeah. Do, you, do, you do you think, think that climate, climate will change? change? Of course, I'm, I'm one, one of those 97%. 97% huh? It's just pure nonsense. It's nothing about science. Science is about what are the facts, what are the evidence, and so on and so forth. There is a very famous statement by, by Professor Albert Einstein, Einstein. I hope you all heard about, about him, right? To, to say, say that, that when he published his stuff on general relativity, there's this 100 Berlin academician who wrote a report against Einstein relativity. And the, and the guy, guy with the wisdom by the name of Einstein said, say, why would you even need a hundred? If I would be wrong, wrong one, one would suffice, suffice right? <laughs> In my humble opinion, opinion after, after studying, studying this topic, topic for close to 30 years, to 30 years now, that, that, that really, really, this, this course is very meaningful. meaningful. There's, There's never, never been, been something about, about the scientific, scientific field that you really try very, very hard to make sure that you all don't get swayed away by people like myself, deniers and so on and so forth. That you know, that you, know you make sure that you, sure that you don't, don't hear us. us. So I thank so Independent Institute for providing, for providing this forum. I hope I don't embarrass any one of you. They really try very hard. And then every time that you say that you want to, oh, I, uh, I want to ask a question. No, 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 no question. You just believe us. Every, every time, time you say, can we have a little debate? debate? I don't understand your facts. Can you explain to me? They just say, no, no, no. El God say so. So we go to this next one. It's another one. One of the world experts is the EPA Air Chief. Freedom, responsibility, openness of government, etc. Let me ask you, what percentage of the atmosphere is CO2? What percentage of the atmosphere is CO2? I don't have that calculation for you, sir. Maybe uh, you could tell us what your personal uh, uh, guess is on what percentage of the CO2. I, I don't make those guesses, sir. You're the head of the EPA and you don't know? You've based, you have all of these laws based on all it. Oh, you're going to get your staffer to tell you now. But you're the head of the EPA and you did not know well, what the. Well, holy shit, what year is that from? High energy particles. High energy particles, physical temperature is we've never been this close. Yeah. I got to do a little setting thing here. All right, here we go. What percentage? And, and now you are tasting policies that impact 
dramatically on the American people, and you didn't even know the bait, what the content of CO2 in the atmosphere was, which is the justification for the very policies you're talking about? No, that, well, that thank you. I, if you, I, if I, you're I, asking me how much CO2 really cool. is, is in the atmosphere, not a percentage, but how much, we have just reached no, levels was, of 400 parts per million. I think million. I was very clear what I was asking, and I was very clear you didn't know. If you don't mind me asking, I forgot what your name is. <laughs> it's, I can't, uh, it's hard for me to say unstructured you understanding, or yeah, see, unstructured understanding. Uh, it's hard for me to say that. Was it Bob? I can't remember. I'm bad. Oh, let me ask you if uh, CO2, from what I have understand. <laughs> It's, it's to make a point. point. These folks want to regulate. They don't want to even study science, right? It's so hard. I mean, sorry, you know. I wish I can be a jellyfish someday. <clears throat> well, we have a problem in the West, right? It's been known that, uh, that there's all this wild-ranging forest fire is damaging our homes and so on and so forth, right? Whatever the reason is, apparently the Professor Jim Hansen from uh, NASA Goddard Institute for Space Study, by the way, you all know who he is, right? He's the father of global warming. He's the man who testified in the Senate in 1988, making a clear statement that he's 99% sure that he has already seen the global warming effect by the carbon dioxide. And you know what? I think he did. I mean, James Hansen really took a beating from the big oil companies and a lot of trolling. That guy, I believe his life was threatened a few times. Um, so, you know what? His his models have been tweaked a little bit, but they're pretty accurate. They're pretty 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 damn close to being spot on. To to say that they aren't is exactly what the Heartland Institute and I guess this is independent institute is. That's what you guys are trying to do is try and debunk it using cherry pick data, and then then projecting and saying that these scientists that made the data are projecting. <laughs> Richard, that's right, okay. Now, I like, I like, the I like that channel name, actually. I just <laughs> I can't say it every time, so I'll just say Richard. All right, let's go on with this really soon. Okay. Is telling you the level of stuff he's doing. He's presenting this talk to show that the, the forest fire numbers, numbers burn in the areas has been increasing. Okay. And, and he showed data from 1960 to about 2017 or so. And this is based on a talk with children, okay, student at the symposium in Taiwan. And I have to say that, you know, that seems very convincing, isn't it? If you're a big authority coming from America, former, you know, NASA director. And I, I think, think the, the God, God is angry right here, right? You know, something is burning. But the problem is, he's pulling such a childish uh, sort of thing. He put uh, actually a link to the, the data set where he got, got it from. from. But he forgot, he forgot that the whole data, data set is available, is available from, from 1946 or so. Or so. Why, would Why would he do such a thing, thing, you know? He basically, <laughs> you all understand, right? He was showing you only that little part, but he forgot to show you from 1926 to 1960. Isn't that... This is why climate climate science is so hard to do anything about. Yeah, yeah. They, they, most of the models, most of the models, they're they're within like whatever you know. They're they're very close to to showing the the correlation of CO two with with the temperature rise. So. And, you know, the, of course, you know, there's other things like uh, feedback loops and stuff like that that have to get fed in there as we go on. It's things that we don't know yet. But, yeah, they're, they're very accurate. And, and the way they talk, it's like, well, we, we, should be, we should be freezing our butts off or something. I don't know. They're, we're not even doing close. But uh, right here, just the I, – I, I have to – now I have to do research now on the forest fire thing to see if his graph is actually true data or not. And that's that's the hard part about climate science is that there's there's so many well I don't know what what the forest I suppose the forest fires have something to do with it because that's part of the sciences in there. But yeah, you know what? <laughs> that's what that's what's hard about it.
Childish, are we, are we serious about science and these are called scientists, right? And I'm not supposed to tell people about this? I don't even know why he bothered to do this actually. So, Professor Hassan, hello. What, but what happened when you do bad science? This is part of the stuff that I have passion about. You know, when you mess around with science, you mess around with me, right? What happened? Well, you got, you got an award. I don't care how many awards he wins. It doesn't matter. And he can't, Willie really Soon is not a dumb guy. He's not a, he's not a dumb guy. Uh, an obtuse person, maybe. And nefarious. I, I would say nefarious because he just, he pounds, he pounds the freaking crap out of things that are debunked. People put the information back into his face that proves him wrong. And he just keeps pounding the same narrative. And it's like that, like that girl was saying, you got to, you got to find a chase that narrative. You know, we don't chase a narrative in science. We, we take the science and we read the data and we, and we make a conclusion after that. We don't follow a narrative. Oh yeah. That's terrible. That, that's terrible. These people are destroying the foundations of what science means. I mean, they're, they're just, they're ruining it. Even, even if, even if <laughs> uh, uh, creationists, they're, they're freaking young earth creationists. Uh, there is no debate, gentlemen. It's fifth grade science. <laughs> okay. It is that kind of problem, the reverse incentive science. You're normally not doing science. You have to do something anti-science to get an award, right? So these people, are, to me, they're just burning everything away. You know, it's dangerous, dangerous. Don't do that, man. Because life is much more beautiful than that. One should not do that. This is just a sneak preview on my own. Study okay. with my friend from uh, University of, of uh, Mexico. By the name of Victor Marasco. We've been looking into the forest fire statistics. This is simply just to show you that the wildfire statistics from about 1930s or so uh, until now, and then we make a forward, for, forward forecast. We analyze, we analyze the data. The data, it turns it turns out that the data has very strong, strong what you call every 10 year, year kind of cycle. cycle. Yes, also every 40 years kind of cycle. And then we train the, the computer using some of this algorithm called artificial intelligence to actually make some forward forecast, just simply to show that you can do some of this exercise. And I don't mean that I already know everything. But this is just an example of what science is all about. Yeah. And then we know that it's summer now, so I, 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 I'm obligated to show this chart from Professor John Christie of University of Alabama, Hansville. It's okay, let's take a look at this. 1895 till about 1905, it looks like an average kind of thing. Then we had a, a peak or something coming up right, right there. That, I suppose 1910 or something like that is when that peak is. And I got that there. And I would say we had a lot more planes up in the air that were able to snag on forest fires. I'm just not sure what. I see a couple spikes here, like a couple years that were had some. Oh, this is record high temperatures. Okay. No. Hottest T Max stations. Do, 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 do. Wait a minute now. What's he doing here? Yeah, well, of course we have spikes. We got, yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, this is this is just a little little snippet here or whatever. And he's oh, from 1895. And if you look back it off from the whole picture or whatever to 10,000, 30,000 years, you'd see that it's a slow, it's all of a sudden starts going right up when the industrial age starts happening. But they don't want you to know that because, well. <laughs> it's to show you all this uh, record daily hottest temperature. Like in Richard United says, it would, uh, so has a very good break their temperature God record so we can go back about from 1895 until now. You, you can see it's been changing up and down, but then what we have now is just what it is. That's all it is, right? It has nothing to do with this because they tend to use that. Oh, every time there's a heat wave, it has to be. If I take a microscope and zoom in on something, it looks completely different. And it's a whole new perspective. And that's kind of what you're doing right there with that little chart that you showed. 
But um, why don't you back off and look at the big picture? Because that's what you got to do. And, and the more data you enter into these models, the more accurate the models become. It's, that's just a fact. With global warming, right? Yeah, what the is this data source? The next one I'm going to show you is that the, cool, the cold wave, when you have excessive uh, snow. This shall be done by the former uh, science advisor to President Obama by the name of John Holdren. Uh, that's what he said. He says that with global warming, we're going to have more cold extreme. Please make sure you understand that facts. <coughs> but i like to remind who John Holdren is, right? John Holdren? Yes, we will have more cold extreme because... We are losing, because when, when the earth heats up so much, there's less contrast between the cold air and the warm air between the polars, the polar caps and the equator. And when that happens, wind slows down. You take an ice cube and put it in a little tank and then you let the, have a heater up there. You'll see that you got wind circulation then because of that. That's what our earth does. And also the rotation of it. But what happens is, our jet stream slows down, and that prevents uh, that prevents that cold air from coming down upon us. But what's happening now is that jet stream has slowed down, and now the cold air can come down and envelop us. And that's why we have these polar vortexes. It's it's pretty well described, Willie. One is one of those that, in my opinion, has been very much uh, an activist from day one. Of course, that's the only reason why. I mean, I'm I'm not a scientist. I'm just a regular Joe, and it's easy to figure these things out. You can go down and, <laughs> of course, the way you put it with your microscope on top of a freaking chart. It's like whatever, dude. Got selected, but he's uh, by President Obama, and then he's the kind of type to say that you have too much energy is kind of bad for people, right? Because we'll be. And then they take little snippets like this. The United States is threatened by far more by the hazards of too much energy too soon than by the hazards of too little too late. It's <sighs> too much energy too soon. And they, 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 if that's all they do at the Heartland Institute. They got a whole team of people sitting there finding ways to discredit something. And it doesn't have to be the truth. It just has to discredit something for their narrative to succeed. Pathetic. Like giving a little kids a machine gun. Yeah. So it is known, and this is even cited in scientific literature because he's a very well-known well character, character, right? He's a, a science advisor, advisor to, the to the president. So in scientific paper, paper people, people even, even cite him that say that with global, global warming, warming, we're going to have extreme, extreme cold waves. Cold waves. Yeah. Yeah. But it, but is, it known. is known. Let's 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 do this uh, really soon. Let's just quick take a quick look at Willie here because. <laughs> Okay, so we got Willie Soon. Let's look at a quick little search on him. Uh, here we go. Work of prominent climate change denier was funded by energy industry. Willie Soon is researcher at Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Documents Koch Brothers Foundation among groups that gave a total of 1.25 million. A prominent academic and climate change denier's work was funded almost entirely by the energy industry, receiving more than $1.2 million from companies, lobby groups, and oil billionaires over more than a decade. Newly released documents show 
Uh, over the fa last 14 years, Willie Soon, a researcher at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, received a total of $1.25 million from ExxonMobil, Southern Company, the American Petroleum Institute, and a foundation run by the ultra-conservative Koch brothers. Documents obtained by Greenspe Greenpeace through Freedom of Information filings show. According to the documents, the biggest single funder was Southern Company, Company one of the country's biggest electricity providers that relies heavily on coal. The documents draw new attention to the industry's efforts to block action against climate change, including President Barack Obama's power plant rules. Unlike the vast majority of scientists, soon does not accept that rising greenhouse gas emissions since the industrial age are causing climate changes. He contends climate change is driven by the sun. Well, no freaking shit is driven by the sun. We know that. Ugh. In the relatively small universe of climate change denial, soon with his Harvard Smithsonian credentials was a sought after commodity. He was cited admiringly by Senator James Inhofe, the Oklahoma Republican who famously called global warming a hoax. And now we got Trump saying that now. So there you have it. There's there's the root of it. He was called to testify when Republicans of the, in the Kansas state legislature tried to block measures promoting wind and solar power. The Heartland Institute, a hub of climate denial, gave soon a courage award. <laughs> a courage award. OK, yeah, for being a lying sack of shit shill. Soon did not enjoy such recognition from the scientific community. Of course not. There were no grants from NASA, the National Science Foundation, or the other institutions which were funding his colleagues at the Center for Astrophysics. According to the documents, his work was funded almost entirely by the fossil fuel lobby. The question here is really, what did API, ExxonMobil, Southern Company, and Charles Koch see in Willie Soon? What did they get for one million plus, said Kurt Davies, a former Greenpeace researcher who filled the original Freedom of Information requests? Greenpeace and the Climate Investigation Center, of which Davies is the founder, share the documents with news organizations. Did they simply hope he was on under research that would dissolve consensus? Or was it too exciting to be able to basically buy the nameplate Harvard Smithsonian? From 2005, Southern Company gave Soon nearly $410,000 in return. Soon promised to publish research about the sun's influence on climate change in leading journals and to deliver lectures about the th his theories at national and international events, according to the correspondence. The funding would lead to active participants in his PI, principal investigator, of, his, of this research proposal in all national and international forums interested in promoting the basic understanding of solar variability and climate change. Soon wrote in a report to Southern Company. In 2012, Soon told Southern Company its grants had supported publications on polar bears, temperature changes in the Arctic and China, and rainfall patterns in the Indian non-Soon. ExxonMobil gave $335,000 but stopped funding Soon in 2010, according to the documents. The astrophysicist reportedly received $274,000 from the main oil lobby the American Petroleum Institute, and $230,000 from the Charles G. Koch Foundation. He received an additional $324,000 in anonymous donations through a trust used by the Kochs and other conservative donors, and the documents showed. Well, uh, you know what? It, this is right here. Uh, I'll put a link to it in the stream here. You can read the rest of it if you want. But, yeah. <laughs> it really soon is a shill. Look at what the titles say, right, of this scientific paper. Let's say that we actually will have a lot less uh, cold extreme, isn't it? That kind of makes sense, right? But every time there's a cold wave during the winter, they send out guys like John Holden coming to defend this uh, status quo of their, their facts. Another paper by more distinguished scientists, Tapio Schneider, is among the best climate dynamicists from Caltech. Clearly also say that global warming will lead to less frequent cold outbreaks in Northern Hemisphere winter. That's basically what science say. He probably didn't want to call out to find out the answer, right? And worse yet, it is well known the IPCC themselves is actually saying that they have long predicted that when you have global warming, you ought to at least have less snowstorm, isn't it? So if you don't believe me, this is what IPCC say. Milder winter temperature will decrease heavy snowstorm. So, so this, this is, is the, the type, type of, of uh, political game and so-called experts are selling to the rest of the world. And of course, this joke is basically, yes, you know, it's going to cover up the dead bird. The next statistics I'm going to show you is about hurricane. TC is tropical cyclone. The activity is going from about 1970 to now. The reason why you start in 1970 here is because this is the satellite era where we have satellite to look at all the statistics. So it's rather more accurate. But the point is, where is the killer trend? You look at anything you want. 
right? Tropical cyclone or extreme hurricane, they're going up and down, up and down, up and down, right? Where is the carbon dioxide alcohol? And then if you look at the more relevant, the impact type, the, the tropical cyclone that actually land on the, you know, come to the land and, and sort of cause damages. Category one, two, three, and four, these are three and four. Okay. You know what? I got to quit right now because I got some things to do today. I've been on an hour, so hey, I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Richard, for showing up here and helping out in the chat down there. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be talking to the walls because nobody came around. But um, I'm going to be doing this more often, so I hope, hope more people will decide to come out here and check it out. I'm trying to get more people to come into the chat with me, too. So anyway, this is Johnny Drive-By, and... <laughs> There's a lot of freaking propaganda out there. Everybody have a great day.